All right, we are going to be looking at Romans chapter 8 today, so if you have your Bible, you can go on and turn there now. What we're going to be focusing in on is breaking free from guilt, from shame, and from condemnation. I suspect it's uh, probably the biggest area of bondage, most common area of bondage that we have. And what I'm talking about is that, that sense of pervasive guilt, that, that low-grade condemnation that always seems to be around. It's the idea that you've got a life that's always partly cloudy with shame. And the Bible says it's probably because of the way you think. It's probably partly because of who you're listening to. See, the big picture is that Scripture tells us, God reveals to us, that we have an accuser that's actively involved in trying to deprive us of the abundant life, the freedom that Jesus Christ came to bring. The uh, book of Revelations talks about Satan as the accuser. The accuser means Satan. Satan means the accuser. And the accuser comes in basically to keep us in bondage. On the other hand, we have an advocate. You can say in this corner we have the accuser. In this corner we've got the advocate. The, the advocate is the Holy Spirit who wants us to experience freedom. Jesus Christ came to give us that freedom. I mean, if somebody asks you, what is the Christian life supposed to do to a person? The answer is, give you freedom. Give you freedom. And you think, well, that sounds kind of dangerous, really. Well, that's exactly what Jesus said he came to do, though. He came to set captives free. The truth will set you free. Freedom is something we need to learn to walk in, to understand what it means. Because that's what the advocate, the Holy Spirit, wants to do, is to bring us to that place where we refuse the lies of the accuser and believe the truth of the advocate. The, the accuser, what does the voice sound like? I mean, it, it's, it's a subtle thing. It's that voice that comes to you when you lay your, your head on the pillow at night and something's telling you that you didn't measure up today. You didn't measure up today. Or, or it gets even more direct and loud where it says, you really failed today. I mean, on the one hand, you, you've been in church and you know that, that Romans tells you that once you've been saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Jesus Christ alone, you are called a saint. But then the enemy comes in, the accuser comes in, and he whispers to you, no saint would do what you did today. You are a sinner. And so you, you move back under that identity of sinner and then out from the identity of saint. And, and listening to this is what causes us to fluctuate constantly between condemnation and I'm okay. Now, the advocate does come in and reminds us of the truth. What is the truth? The truth is, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What happens tomorrow? There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. See, what is now? Now is a present word that's present with you every moment you walk through this life. Now is now. Then was now. Tomorrow's going to be now, but now is there. Now there is no condemnation. Zip, zilch, zero, nada, no condemnation. No condemnation at all that comes in for those who are in Christ Jesus. This is, if you don't recognize it, what Romans chapter 8 verse 1 says. Therefore, therefore what? How? Why is it therefore? Because at this point, we're at Romans chapter 8. We're picking up where we left off in our series from the fall. We looked at Romans chapters 1 through 7 in the fall. And Romans chapters 1 through 7 is an explanation of the gospel, an explanation of what it's all about. And Romans chapter 8 begins now with what we do with this, how we walk it out, how we experience it, how we live it. Therefore, because of everything that's been said in Romans chapters 1 through 7, therefore, if you really read it, if you really understood it, if you really believe it, therefore you know there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. John Piper said that this is the most important verse in the most important chapter in the most important book in the world. And I, I see where he's coming from. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones, another famous preacher from mid-20th uh, century, said that most of our troubles in life are because of a failure to realize the truth of Romans 8.1. I mean, that's a lot to say about one little short sentence, that most of our troubles are because we fail to realize that there is now no condemnation. We're failing to realize that we have been declared by God to be free. The reality is that in Christ there is no condemnation, and the choice that we have as we experience life is a choice of listening to the advocate or to the accuser. And it's, it's a really big deal. 
it's a really big deal who we listen to because the voice that you believe is going to determine the future that you experience. I'm not talking about the voice you listen to is going to determine the destination of your future, heaven or hell. But the voice that you listen to is going to determine the future in this life that you experience, how you experience the reality of your identity and who you are. And if you're listening to the, the accuser, it doesn't mean you lose your salvation, but you lose the benefits of it in this life. And the advocate is coming in and saying, no, you've got a purpose for eternity, but you've got a purpose now too. And to have that purpose walked out to experience the future that God wants for you, we need to, to be careful who we listen to. What we see in Romans 8, verses 1 to 3, is the culmination of the gospel explanation. Let's look at a little more than just verse 1. It says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life, uh, that's referring to the principle of the spirit of life given in the gospel, <clears throat> the, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law or the principle of sin and death that we see in the Old Testament. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, because people are trying to walk out the law, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. You see where the reversal of condemnation comes in? No condemnation for you, he condemns sin. He condemns the sin now. And where is the sin gone? The sin has gone to Jesus. There's this double imputation that happens. Well, what happens is that as we trust what Jesus did on the cross, we saw this in the first seven chapters, the the righteousness of Jesus Christ, his perfect life is imputed to us. And we're justified. We're declared righteous by God by grace through faith and that imputed righteousness of Jesus. And what happens to our sin? It's imputed to Jesus. I mean, it has this weird verse in Corinthians that he became sin for us. I mean, I don't even try to work with that. I mean, he took it on. Somehow he became it. He certainly doesn't walk in sin anymore, so I don't know how this works out for him in eternity. But the idea is, it's a point that God is making for us, a point that there's been an exchange. It's called the great exchange with his righteousness to us, our sin to him. And we're supposed to understand that this means there is now no condemnation, no condemnation. The point being that you are as much loved and accepted by God on your worst day as you are on your best day. Why? Why is that? Because it's not about how you acted on your worst day or how you act on your best day. It's because you have the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ has come into you. That means there's no more performance required. There's no more pretending required. Yeah, we're going to obey God. We're going to act it out. We're going to do what we've been created and reborn to do. But we don't perform for righteousness or approval or acceptance from God. And we don't have to pretend in front of anybody else because it's really kind of meaningless when we do because they don't get a vote in terms of whether we get through the pearly gates or not, right? I mean, the idea here is that we, we understand that this is where it all lies. Condemnation is, again, a battle. A battle, though, that's, that's very common, and, and many feel it. What is condemnation exactly? Condemnation is, is, in essence, a legal term, and it's what you'd think of in a common sense way, that when somebody has committed a crime and they're convicted of the crime, they're condemned to the punishment that follows for that crime, right? Well, the same thing follows with a debt that's owed. You're condemned in terms of legal proceedings, and you have to repay the debt that was, was owed. So that's definitely what's going on here when he's talking about no condemnation. No more punishment, no more debt owed. But I think we can go a little further with it, because when I'm thinking about it, it also brings into play a, um, a construction sense also. But what happens with the building department when, when a house is junk and it's not suitable to be lived in? They condemn. They condemn the house. And they put a, a, a notice on it, condemned, condemnation notice on, on the house. And what, what does that mean? It means that, that this place isn't worth occupying. This place is worthless. This place is dangerous. When I was in college, um, I spent almost two years living in... Um, a friend of, with a friend of mine in a, a city transit bus that had been converted into a, a mobile home. Now, that's using terms very loosely because it had no tires on it, so it wasn't mobile by any means. And he did the, the renovation process himself, so it was junk inside. 
And it was, it was parked on an old golf course that had been abandoned for like 25 years. So it was all grown up, woods and bushes all around it. And we had an extension cord that ran over to where the golf cart maintenance shed used to be for our electricity. And we had a water hose that went back to, the old, to an old Montessori school that was behind us that hooked up so we had water. It was an outside shower and, you know, walls around it, but we had to shower outside. It was cold in the wintertime there. Kids from Montessori School would be peeking up under the bushes all the time. It was weird. I won't even tell you what the toilet situation was like. It was, it was, it was awful. It was dirty. It was nasty. I mean, we spent most of our time in the lawn chairs up on the roof, which was our sun deck. And, and I didn't want anybody to know I lived there. I mean, I'd get a ride home, you know, from, from schools and college. I'd get a ride home with somebody, and I'd have them drop me off like a half mile away to walk in. I mean, I was embarrassed about the place. There was no notice of condemnation on there because nobody from the county knew it was even back there. They wouldn't think anybody would even think of living in something like that. But I was, I was embarrassed about it. I think this is the first time today that I've actually publicly talked about, you know, where I spent my time. But the point being is... It gave me a sense of being less than, you know, to be living in that kind of place. It's, it's kind of what happens, I think, sometimes when we, we have these, these, these feelings that come in that, that we're under condemnation and not worthy because what are we saying? We're not worthy of occupation by the Holy Spirit. We're not worthy of, of the residence of the Holy Spirit, you know, in us. And so we have this, this weird less than, you know, kind of idea going on, and we're constantly trying to work things with God by, by the stuff that we do for God to, to make him think, hey, we are worthy of it. And while that sounds good, and while it even looks good to people from the outside looking in, it's dishonoring to God, and it's a matter of unbelief that motivates it. And, and we're not in the place that we should be because what's happening with us is we're, we're, letting, we're letting feelings rule over, over facts. It, it's kind of like um, the parable of the prodigal son. It's having an older brother mentality about your own life. The older brother, what, what, what did he think? Well, he's got this younger brother that goes off and, and blows his money, and he spends some time working in a pig pen. And the older brother mentality is basically, well, you were in a pig pen for a while. That needs to be your permanent mailing address. And this is somehow what comes in for a lot of us, you know, because we had time spent in a pig pen. And we, we come back, again, that's metaphorically speaking, we come back and, and we have that, that lingering feeling that somehow we're, we're still dealing with the condemnation. The general rule is we can't let our feelings rule our life. Facts can change your feelings. Facts should change your feelings. I mean, for example... I'd say that you heard your, your girlfriend was killed Friday night in a car accident, and you're distraught. And you're destroyed. I mean, you're so, so messed up with that. And then I come into the room, and I say, hey, I just saw her 10 minutes ago in Safeway. What's going to happen? Well, if, if your friend has a, a sound mind, she's going to let the facts rule over the feelings. And the fact, the truth that, that the friend's still alive is going to Take the feelings away. It's kind of like Monago Restaurant. Monago Hotel, down south from here, Monago Restaurant's been open for 100 years, best chop, pork chops around, and, and people love it. I, I, I've always loved Monago Restaurant. And notice came out a little while ago that they sold Monago Hotel. And then that followed with a notice that Monago Restaurant's closing down, and everybody gets all distraught. They start feeling like this is awful. And then yesterday, the newspaper came out, no, Monago Restaurant's not closing down. They're staying open. So what happens? The truth comes in, and it should, should overrule the feelings. The truth, as it comes in, should overrule the feelings that come in for us. The idea for us is Romans 8.1 is the truth. The, Romans 8.1 is, is a fact, and that fact should take precedence over the, the feelings we have about whether our condemnation, our guilt, our shame is, is something that's somehow justified. We're supposed to change our feelings as we believe what is really true. But, but some struggle with it. There, there was a guy in the church here uh, 15, 18 years ago. He loved Jesus, received Christ as Savior, said he believed that he was going to heaven because of his faith in Jesus. And at the same time, he was an older fellow who's in his 80s. He, uh, he told me, he confided to me, that, um, that you know, he knew he'd been forgiven by God, but he could never forgive himself because he'd had an affair about 25, 30 years earlier. His wife stayed with him. His wife knew about it. She stayed with him. They were still married. He said, I, I can never forgive myself for this. I can never forgive myself for this. Now, on the one hand, you know, listen to him, and I thought, you know, there's, there's some honor involved there, perhaps. 
He's owning his sin. That's wonderful. We need to do that. He's apologized. He's repented, meaning he's turned from it, and he'd never done that dirty deed again. But this idea of continuing in a place of not forgiving himself was not an honorable place to be. It's the place of an unbeliever. Because again, while it sounds like it's something that has strength and value and character to it, what it is is putting yourself in a place apart from God's place. If God's forgiving you, then you need to let go too. You need, I need to let myself, you need to let yourself off the hook to the same degree that God has let you off the hook. Talked about it a couple, three weeks ago. The idea that, what does it say in Hebrews? Hebrews a couple places in Jeremiah. It says that when God forgives us, he forgets it. Now, he's not talking about a cognitive memory wipe that he goes through, but he's saying, I don't remember it in terms of our relationship together anymore. It has no impact on it. And so when we continue to bring things up before God, over and over and over again, and I'm thinking, this guy too, this guy from, you know, 20 years ago, he's bringing this up before God, God, please forgive me for, for my sin of adultery. At some point, after the first time, I think, he repented and sought forgiveness, at some point, I think God's saying, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know why you keep bringing this up before me. I have no record of this offense that you're talking about. And that, in a sense, is how we need to understand things. Again, we need to own our sin. We need to repent of our sin. We need to confess our sin. And once done, if reparations are possible, make reparations for our sin. But past that, we need to let go of our sin. And we need to have this forgiveness coming in where we believe there is now, now, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And what is that? That is God-glorifying. That is not you dodging a bullet that is glorifying the death and resurrection of the Savior on the cross and buying into what it means in, in a way that, that, that's going to make a lot of difference in terms of how we live out our life. And I think in terms of honoring God in terms of what's going on. The idea is no condemnation means that, that we are forgiven. And as far as God's record books are concerned, I think it's forgotten that Christ has, has set us free. The victory is, is already yours you have the victory through Christ. See, I'm paid to read the Bible, and I've read it all the way through the end, and I understand that we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, and that has put us in a place where we are declared sons and daughters of God, and we are loved by him, and we are in his family, and there is now no condemnation, nor will we ever move out of a place where we're living in the now, and we have a freedom a freedom in heart, mind, and, and actions that are supposed to flow from that. Again, it frees us from performance and pretending. It sets us free, and it puts us in the place where we start recognizing that the Christian life is not about sin management. It's about relationship with Jesus. Again, we, we get apart from sin. We set apart sin. We repent of sin. We abandon sin. But that's not the focus the focus is relationship with Jesus. The focus is a matter of faith that changes the way we live. You've probably heard this before, beach ball theology. Okay, what happens when you go to Hapuna and you've got a huge beach ball and you try to put it under the water? You can hold it down for a while and then you let it go and it pops back up. Okay, think about that beach ball. That's, that's sin. That's sin. And if you've got a, a lifestyle of sin management, what are you doing? You're trying to hold that beach ball down under the, under the water so that nobody sees it and so that it's gone. It's gone. I don't see it. It's not there. And then you tire out eventually and it pops back up. What's the real picture? real picture is down under the water. Jesus takes out his pocket knife and he pops that thing. It never comes back up. This is the idea. It's done with. Sin has been destroyed by that. Sin has been destroyed in terms of its power in our lives and in terms of what's supposed to be going on and how we look at it. We've been set free. Romans 3.23 Jesus was the propitiation for our sin. He paid for our sin. He's the perfect payment. It's a fact, and that double imputation has come in where we have his righteousness, and he has taken that sin. No condemnation, I think, is, is often very simply a, a matter of memory. It's a matter of remembering what the, the advocate has said, what the Holy Spirit has said, because the Holy Spirit's the one who wrote the Bible. Now, sometimes, this little tangent here, 
Sometimes we'll look at Scripture, and some people look at, at uh, the epistles, Romans, for example. And they go, well, that's written by the Apostle Paul, and he's a smart guy, and he's creating this logical legal argument in chapters 1 through 7, and now he needs to craft a way to transition to how we live this out. And he's d- done a, a, a great job here in crafting how his, his flow of, of argument goes all the way through, blah, 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 blah. Maybe he did, but the point is he didn't write Romans. It's not his idea to have Romans. The Holy Spirit did Romans through the Apostle Paul's hand, yes. But, but unless we have the idea, the belief, the certainty that all Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for our correction and training, we're going to always be looking for a way to avoid the Scriptures that we don't like by saying, well, you know, you got to understand Paul's character as he's writing this stuff down. He was just a cranky old guy. He was just this. He was just that. You know, you go that way, and you're writing your own Bible, and it's not the Holy Spirit written Bible anymore. It's the idea that, yes, people did write the Bible. God used people. God used the way they were put together to put it down, but as the final product comes out here, it's God-breathed, and we've got to understand and believe that this is God speaking the truth and reality. So what happens if we forget what God has said, that there is now no condemnation. What happens is guilt comes back in. What happens is unworthiness comes back in. What happens is pain. What happens is a drive to prove ourselves. But why, why, do, why do so many of us, me, you, why do we try to prove ourselves? Why do we try to rise up, you know, cream of the crop kind of thing? I mean, what's going on with that? It's, again, because we don't really believe there's now no condemnation. Why is it that we're overly sensitive to criticism? Because we think it's speaking to our identity again. Why is it that we become defensive? Why is it we've got a lack of confidence in relationships? Why is it we have a lack of confidence in our relationship with the Father? Because we don't believe there's now no condemnation. It affects the way we worship. It affects the way we pray. We're unable to pray the promises of God. We don't believe the promise is attached to us, sons or daughters, because we can't believe that we're worthy as sons or daughters to be bringing these promises up as inheritance rights that we have in the kingdom. All of this stuff comes into play. All of it starts rising up as we don't remember the no condemnation. I mean, sometimes it even leads to addictive behavior, which can be a reaction to a deep sense of, of guilt and unworthiness, just trying to kill the sense of, of, of guilt and unworthiness. Also, Christians who don't understand the no condemnation only obey out of fear and duty. They obey. They've been saved by grace through faith. They know they're supposed to obey, and they do obey, but they do it out of a sense of fear and duty, a fear and duty that thinks God's going to pound them if they don't line up, and a duty that says, well, we've got to do this because it's how we earn our way all the way into heaven. The truth is, the more powerful motivation is love and gratitude. And it's the motivation that Scripture points to. Not fear and duty, but love and gratitude. I mean, without understanding Romans 8.1, we might memorize the whole chapter 8, or, or better still, all of the book of Romans, and, and at the same time miss the real sense of it. Um, I read this last week a, um, an illustration by Martin Lloyd-Jones, really great preacher of mid-20th century, and he, he summed up Romans 8.1 this way. He said, the difference between an unbeliever sinning and a Christian sinning is the difference between a man transgressing the laws of the state and a husband who has done something he should not do in his relationship with his wife. He is not breaking the law. He is wounding the heart of his wife. That's the difference. It's no longer a legal matter. It's a matter of personal relationship and love. The man does not cease to be the husband legally. Law doesn't come into the matter at all. In a sense, it's something much worse than legal condemnation. You've sinned, of course, but you've sinned against love. You may and should feel ashamed, but you should not feel condemnation because to do so is to put yourself back under the law. It, it's the, the idea that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It's the idea that, that the, the, the call that we have, the greatest command we have is to love God. 
it, it's, it's the response that he wants from us, and he wants that love relationship with us, and the relationship we have with him is not about not breaking the law, like the husband breaking the legal statutes of the state. The concern, rather, is breaking his heart. That's a, kind of a mushy way to talk about God. But to, to offend love. It's an offense against love. And, and this is what needs to be the primary concern for us as we, we live out and walk out this, this no condemnation. How are we being delivered from this, this whole thing? Well, we see that, that what we have going on here is, is a process. Romans 8.1 says no condemnation. Romans 8 verse 2 takes it a step further and says no domination. Right? One says we're not condemned by actions. Romans 8.2 says we're not dominated any longer by sin. Let's take a look at Romans 8.2. Do we have just verse 2 up there? For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. We'll just stop right there. The law of the spirit of life, the principle of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the principle of sin and death. What it's talking about there is that we're set free from power. The, the verse refers to a force and power of sin and how the Holy Spirit comes to free us from that bondage, that force and power, that domination. We're delivered from condemnation, and we're being delivered, part of our sanctification, is we're being delivered from the actual power of sin. How? How are you being delivered? Because the Holy Spirit who gives us power enables us to do what we couldn't do before, and that's obey God. Um, St. Augustine had this explained in a, in a way that's helped me. Maybe it helps some of you. He talks about it in, in, in terms of four eras of, of um, human redemptive history. He talks about the first stage, Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, created by God, and they had the ability to sin. And they proved they had that ability by eating the forbidden fruit, right? So they had the ability to sin. When they were first living in the garden, they didn't exercise that ability, but then they did. After the fall, they ate the fruit. Then we move into the second era of redemptive history, and that is the inability not to sin. In other words, we can't help but sin. There's no way anybody can not sin. That's the second era under the law. And then Jesus comes. And what happens when Jesus comes? And we receive that imputed righteousness from him. And more importantly, or most importantly, we receive the Holy Spirit's indwelling presence. We then have the ability not to sin. You go, I don't know if I'd buy that. Well, it's there. We've got the ability not to sin with the Holy Spirit in us. We're not walking it out perfectly, but we have that ability to say no. We've got that ability not to live under condemnation. We've got that ability not to let sin dominate. We can say no where we couldn't say no before. And then there's a fourth um, era of redemptive history that we'll get to at some point where, at least Augustine said, we will move to into a state where we have the, the inability to sin. The inability to sin. I, I have no idea what that looks like. But the idea for us is that we, we've got this place now where we've been given the power to abide in Christ. We've been given the power to abide in Christ. We've been given the power to walk in the Spirit and to work out our salvation. Um, in the next few verses of Romans 8, verses 4 to 11, what we have here is a discussion of having a mind set on the flesh, that is, old ways, or a mind set on the Spirit. And the point of all of this, a summary, is that it focuses on the tight connection between our, our thinking and our living, between what we have our mind set upon, what we focus upon, and, and how we end up living life out. And I'm not going to read through that whole thing now. Uh, I encourage you to, to read through it yourself because this matter of mindset is, is extremely important, but it's all grounded in that original mindset of no condemnation. It goes on to say that, that we need to really be believing, though, in verse 9, that you're not in the flesh if you have Jesus you have the Holy Spirit in you. The Spirit dwells in you. Again, that means that you're not condemned. You're not an unfit building. The enemy continues to whisper that you are, that you are unfit, but God says, no, you're not unfit for use because I am dwelling in you. Now, let's connect this up as we close up here with Jesus Christ's crucifixion and death. What happened when Jesus drew his last breath and died on the cross? What happened? There was an earthquake. We heard that. And it also talks about 
the Holy of Holies, the Holy of Holies, and how there was a curtain that was split right down the middle when Jesus died. What, what was that all about? I suggest to you, the curtain split in the Holy of Holies where the presence of God was supposed to have dwelt because God left the building. Because God left the building. And what happened when God left the building? He came out from that one location of the temple and he took up residence as the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost and after in the multiple temples that are intended to go out and take the commission to the world. You and I are temples of the Holy Spirit. You and I are temples being created. We together, Peter tells us, why we call this place living stones, we're being fitted together as this temple that's made up of individual temples, but the Holy Spirit residing in everyone who's received Jesus that has God's presence in them because of Jesus, and then what are we supposed to do with it? We're supposed to be people as a group that see God's will done on earth as it, as it is in heaven, that, that as a group come together with complementing gifts that are able to take the message of the gospel out and make disciples, that are able to bring glory to God and enjoy the process of, of all of this as we, as we, as we go along. Again, the enemy is going to continue to try to to make your righteousness all about you. And the truth is, the facts are, that your righteousness is not about you. Your righteousness is what the simple gospel says. It's all about Jesus. Jesus is our righteousness. If you continue to insist that your righteousness is based on your behavior, you're going to be a very unhappy person and not much fun to be around. If you you accept the gospel, that Jesus is our righteousness, that there's no condemnation because of Jesus, you're not going to go wild and live a sinful life. You've got God residing in you. You're going to see his word. It's going to bring conviction, not condemnation. And conviction is something that comes in and says, this is the problem, do something about it. And we're going to have the power to do something about it, to change. And God's glorified. And we're happy. And life goes on the way God intends for it to go on with his end results finally met. So, wind this up real quick. What do we do this week? Number one, if you are here and you have never confessed Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you believe that Jesus Christ did die on a cross for your sins, and you are ready to receive that gift for your salvation, then you need to talk to somebody in the prayer ministry team and confess Jesus Christ as sin. Romans 10, 9. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Confess with your mouth that he's Lord, and you shall be saved. If you're in that point, at that point already, then that's wonderful. Get baptized also next week. Number two, though, choose to forgive yourself, Hebrews 10, 22. Accept God's forgiveness of all past sin and failure so completely that we let ourselves off the hook for our past to the extent that God has already done. Number three, admit the facts of your past, but declare to yourself and to Satan, it's paid for. It's paid for. And that means that we're keeping on the breastplate of righteousness. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6 talks about our spiritual armor. You've probably read that before. And one of the pieces of spiritual armor is the breastplate of righteousness. And that's also translated as the breastplate of God's approval. We need to keep God's approval on. That means we need to maintain a confidence that we are approved of God. Not because we were good boys and girls last week but we're approved of God because we have believed and trusted what Jesus Christ did and that we have his imputed righteousness and we stand on that. That is the breastplate of righteousness that guards our heart against the accuser's lies that come in that tries to convince us we're unworthy and less than. And then number four, number four, we remind ourselves regularly that my righteousness is by impartation and not by imitation. Impartation and not by imitation. There's a famous book written by a guy named Thomas Akempis that was called Imitation of Christ. And great idea, imitate Christ, not bad to imitate Christ, but don't get trapped in the lie that your imitation of Christ brings righteousness. Your imputation of his life by grace through faith brings righteousness. Then imitate Christ all you want. In fact, imitate Christ, and that's great. We should imitate Christ, but we don't imitate Christ for the obtaining of righteousness. That's works. We receive by faith the imputation, and then we live in our sanctification, the imitation that should follow. Does that all make sense? I hope so. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your love, your goodness, your grace, your power, your mercy. 
We thank you, Father, that we can stand as sons and daughters by grace through faith in Jesus, and we can declare to our own minds and to the enemy, and as he lies to us tonight as we get ready to sleep, there is now no condemnation for me because I am in Christ Jesus. I ask you to enable us, Father, to know how to walk this out, to know how to carry the message out, to know how to enjoy our freedom and be the spreaders of freedom as we, as we bring the truth of the gospel that delivers from hell and provides the access that we, we must have to heaven. And in the meantime, that we fulfill the responsibilities that you've given us here on this earth. For your glory, Father, we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.